Hello, welcome to the opening plenary of the Platypus Convention. The International Convention happens annually. My name is Pam Magalis. I'm one of the founding members of Platypus. And today we're going to talk about 1989, the end of history, question mark. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, give you a brief description of the panel, and then we're going to get started. So this year marks the 30th anniversary of the 1989 revolutions, the autumn of nations in the Soviet bloc. For two entire generations, the USSR and the Cold War are historical relics of the distant past. Despite this, the left, the left of today lives in remembrance of the struggles of the 20th century. This poses the question of whether the 20th century is essentially defined by the simultaneous possibility and impossibility of the October Revolution of 1917, or by the, quote, end of history, inaugurated by the collapse of the USSR in 1989. In other words, we ask, has the 20th century passed in vain? More specifically, 1989 is largely remembered as a decisive close to the Cold War contest between communism and capitalism. With the victory, oh, don't worry guys, we're ready. <laughs> You hear me? Mm -hmm. yep. All right. Uh, between communism and capitalism, with the victory of the latter casting a seemingly damning verdict against Marxism as a form of politics, the planned economies based on collectivized property of these states were indicated as failures, and their totalitarian regimes called into question the very notion of a working class rule. The fall of communism thus profoundly affected the left's ability to imagine the overcoming of capitalism and the possibility of a classless society beyond it. But in passing into history, the meaning of 1989 can also be reconsidered. The Platypus Affiliated Society wants to use this anniversary to reassess on the present, sorry, to reassess the question of how 1989 weighs on the present. What is the significance of 1989 in its historical context? and what is its relevance for left politics today. So, with that said, let me introduce our panelists for the evening. Uh, from my left, we have Robert Bird, Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Chicago. Next to him is Patrick Quinn. He's a founding member of Solidarity and a member of DSA. Next to him is John Abbott, Professor of History at the University at Chicago, UIC, European History. And John Batchel, Chairman of the Communist Party USA. And last but not least, Earl Silbar, member of the Students for a Democratic Society back in the left, and member now of Fox Valley Citizens for Peace and Justice. Earl is also part of Progressive, uh, of the PSL, uh, Progressive Socialist Labor. Uh, and he says that he's been an activist since 1961 as a socialist or communist. All right, so we're gonna have a 10 minute introductory comments by each of our panelists. Then we're gonna have a quick response, three to four minutes from each. And then hopefully the remaining time we'll have a lively Q&A. Please give a warm welcome to our panelists. I'm, used, I'm, a, I'm a Mac person. I've talked about from beginning. From beginning, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> what is it here? Anyway, maybe you can uh, find the first one. And, um, Concurrent live. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 
It's on that slide. It's okay. It's okay. You've got. So this, I was asked to speak to you about uh, the fall of communism. Um, and I, not being not being sure of the format, I I thought I, I don't know what I have to say more than what I said, said ten years ago um, on the twentieth anniversary. So I dug out my presentation from then, and I'm going to give you a personal narration. Um, and I apologize for this, but um, it's okay. Um, it was, in retrospect, merely the hollow shell of a once fearsome system. But we still felt pangs of trepidation as we passed by train from Finland into the USSR in the middle of June 1989. We had, after all, just watched the events at Tiananmen Square, which seemed to us to put an end to any premature dreams of an end to dictatorship in communist countries. Most of us had begun studying Russian amidst the spirit of hopeful liberalization that accompanied Gorbachev's accession to power. But there were few illusions about the limits of what was possible in a world defined by the stark, brutal opposition between us and them, East and West, to communism and capitalism. It all seemed summed up in General Yaruzelsky's cynically tinted glasses. In my teenage rebellion, I once bought and wore a red hammer and sickle t-shirt, but that was only a provocation, much like Eugenio Ferrari's hammer and sickle statue here on the campus of the University of Chicago. I had read Marx with interest, but also studied economics. I was all very confused at the time. I was familiar with Orwell, Huxley, Kessler, Clockwork Orange, and other books that would, could easily disabuse one of utopia. <clears throat> and it, but in the bipolar world of the Cold War, any opposition to one's own society tended almost irrepressibly to affirm the dreams, if not the reality, of the other side. No less than 1984, the novel, my mood was captured by the, the uh, punk song 1989, sunk to, sung to the kazoo by punk troubadour Spizoil. In 1989, he sings, when the vineyards have run out of wine, the beer won't be all that bad, but the price of it will make you mad. <laughs> Eastern Europe presented at least an imaginary alternative to what I knew, and in that sense, it bore an irresistible link to a dreamable future. What we discovered when we studied the Eastern Bloc, it was an entire parallel world, as if out of a science fiction novel, with its own hierarchies. Uh, so that people from all over the Eastern Bloc would vacation in spots like Bulgaria and Croatia, had its own lingua franca, or rather lingua rasa, which almost everyone was supposed to learn to a certain degree. More importantly, perhaps it had its own myths centered on World War II. As soon as we arrived, our Soviet hosts dutifully began to initiate us into these myths. Our first excursion in Leningrad was to the huge ceremony, the cemetery that holds hundreds of thousands of war dead in mass unnamed graves. We would take to the Museum of the Revolution, the Museum of the Blockade, and many other depositors <coughs> of official collective memory. But what startled us upon arriving here at this palace of youth was not it was the contradiction between the myths and our immediate experiences, not so much the lines that snaked for up to 100 yards in front of the entrances to songs. <clears throat> Shops, sorry, as you can tell, I'm fighting this cold. The first Soviets we met were shady young men right in this parking lot here, um, offering us marijuana, much like shady young men world, around, world around, uh, over. Or perhaps they were KGB provocateurs trying to get some Western kids into trouble. Already in 1989, we could, this is a view out of my window, um, we, one could see that like the local currencies, the Eastern values had long lost their value. As much as in the West developing world, one would frequently encounter faded, outdated Western calendars with pinups or racing girls. A friend of mine collected Western beer cans. On several occasions, I encountered impromptu public gatherings formed around political debates or musical performances, which seemed fearful and fragile. My friends were as likely to view it all as a 
HEB provocation as they were to dismiss it all out of hand as meaningless chatter. The fundamental opposition was between people who crowded in shock youth, official meetings, unofficial demonstrations or mobs, and those who remained in solitary and private spaces with a close circle of friends bound by absolute loyalty to each other. Life, or at least anything worthy of the name, took place indoors. That's not a task. Um, I was lucky to have a number of friends uh, through previous student travel travelers who would take me from the gray streets into a life filled with color. I took to staying out late, returning home amidst the glorious white nights, the sun hovering dangerously at the horizon. It was from in these warm and <clears throat> um, claustrophobic domestic spaces that I viewed the events of 1989. In Czechoslovakia, the protests began in January and continued without police repression. In Poland, solidarity was suddenly legalized as an opposition force and elected into power with almost unanimous support. In Hungary, the Communist Party seemed intent on turning its country into a democratic and capitalist one. <clears throat> Throughout this period, though, information in the Soviet Union was very difficult to have, uh, very difficult to come by. This is the white nights with the sun hovering the public gathering um, the queues. Let me get to my news. These are the domestic spaces. Here we go. Um, the Soviet newspapers reported some of the events in Eastern Europe, but only in brief blurbs that lacked context and were highly enigmatic. Um, on the 24th of October, 1989, we read, in its vestia of public protests in East Germany following the election of Egon Krenz, Without actually explaining how the East Germans had been flooding to the West through Hungary, the article noted that the government was willing to allow citizens to return home. This was on page seven of a newspaper dominated by speeches from the USSR parliament. I distinctly remember a, an article um, from this day, the 14th of December, when um, the, the Pravda informed Soviet readers that presidential elections were impending in Czechoslovakia. The first candidate was the um, leader of the Communist Party. The second was a prominent, com prominent communist from Prague Spring running as an independent. A third was Alexander Dubček. Almost as an afterthought, the article mentioned Václav Havel running for the civil forum, which the article proceeds to portray as a strangely reactionary force arguing against popular elections. I knew from the BBC that Havel was a clear favorite, but the weak attempt at obfuscation on page six of the newspaper was quite puzzling. Similar stories unfolded about Romania, I won't bore you with it, but um, the populist rhetoric of Soviet ideology, as I sat in this apartment building here over the winter, uh, the populist rhetoric of Soviet ideology ended up tying the leadership's hands within the Soviet Union and preventing them from opposing outright what were clearly democratic choices being made throughout Eastern Europe. And their attention became focused on averting these same outcomes in the frigid, frozen USSR. None of the future that we know was evident as I left the Soviet Union in May 1990, heading West on the train. I traveled by train in part because Westerners would buy tickets at the same rate as Soviets, which put the Moscow-London route at about $6. I stopped for a few days in Berlin and caught the final days of the border between West and East, the last remnants of the war. I visited the shrine here to those who had died crossing the walls. I was struck by the most recent grave dated February of, the, of 1989. I took the train across the barren no man's land, past the shell of the Reichstag, and walked to Alexanderplatz, which struck me with its Moscow proportions. Today, it is increasingly difficult to tell where the wall passed in Berlin, almost impossible. The entire socialist period seems to have disappeared from public view, no less from public minds. There is, however, inevitably, a sadness about this loss. 
The exuberant carnival of revolutions may have upturned the established hierarchies, but they have not, to the disappointment of many, abolished hierarchy. In many cases, the old elites quickly adapted to the new rules and reinvented themselves as populist demagogues. People missed many things in the lost civilization known as developed socialism. One of them that has been lost, one of the things most lost most irrevocably is that warm, colorful domestic space of trust and freedom, the closest, perhaps, one can get to communism. But was this, too, an illusion? Most palpably, like the world wars for previous generations, the fall of communism had integrated our personal lives, if only fleetingly, into what one might call history. It was an event which I personally and many of my peers found where, where many, many of our, I and many of our peers found ourselves at the mercy and amidst the grace of history, when we understood that our inscrutably individual interests and desires were actually symptoms of a historical condition, common to many, but endlessly more massive than we could imagine. We were powerless to act, even, as you've seen, to take decent photographs, and were left to reflect long after that we had been drawn to Eastern Europe as the funeral of, of, of what had previously passed for our future. We have, in many respects, yet to work out a new shape for this future, and one wonders what, is, what it is like to grow up today without such expectations. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <coughs> Next we have Patrick Quinn. Thank you. Well, I'll take a bit of a different uh, approach uh, from the one that you just heard. Um, I've been a socialist for almost 60 years, since 1960. I was, uh, went to socialism uh, actually by a person who was a student here at the University of Wisconsin. He was in a so... We're in Pardon? Chicago. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Chicago. That's right. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, I've been socialist uh, for some 60 years, and I was on to socialism by an individual who was a student at the uh, University of uh, Chicago uh, during the 1950s. He was a member of uh, a socialist organiza organization called YPSO. That stood for the Young People's Socialist League. And in the University of uh, Chicago chapter at that time, besides this individual who had to be my college professor at the time, I was a freshman in college. In that uh, particular chapter of YPSL at the University of Chicago right here were a number of uh, people, including uh, Bernie Sanders, somebody you may have heard of. Uh, uh, that's where Sanders was going to uh, socialism right here in Chicago. Uh, so uh, I find uh, this discussion of the year uh, 1989 to be uh, somewhat problematic because in, in my own lifetime I was a socialist for 30 years before 1989 and I've been a socialist for 30 years after 1989. Uh, things were changed by the events of uh, 1989 as well and I think uh, as our colleague next to me indicated uh, they changed quite significantly. I happened to be in Berlin in 1989 and right after the uh, wall came down. And what I recall, I was in, uh, on the East Berlin side of the wall, and what I recall is all of these East Berliners you know, going through the checkpoint, which they could never go through before, and coming back with boom boxes on their shoulders. They simply went into West Berlin and they bought goods that they would never been able to buy. And I, I said, God, is this what capitalism's all about, that you can buy a boom box? And, uh, you know, if you know what those mean. Uh, uh, you know, a few people bought cameras and so on and so forth. Uh, um, so 89 certainly uh, was important. I was in Czechoslovakia during that year, in Poland, uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, among other uh, uh, Eastern European countries. But what I'm more concerned with is what has happened in the years in the United States uh, prior to 1989 and subsequent to 1989. Because uh, as, as certainly as a member of the left, and by left I, I mean 
you know, people who really challenge the notion of capitalism as the prevailing economic mode uh, globally, uh, who, are, uh, who opt for a, another uh, type of economic and social and political society. Uh, that's what I mean by the left. I don't mean the, the Democratic Party as opposed to Trump or anything of that sort of thing. Um, I think that if one would look at the year uh, 2019, 30 years after uh, 1989, one would uh, find that the left in the United States is weaker than it ever has been in its uh, his entire history. Certainly going back to the, uh, to the period before the great strike waves of 1877, for example, um, during the latter uh, uh, fourth century of the 19th century, of course, uh, the, the left grew. It grew through uh, events such as the Great Strike Wave of 77, the Haymarket uh, events uh, right here in Chicago in 1886, uh, and then certainly up through 1905, the founding of the industrial uh, workers of the, uh, of the world. Uh, it, it ran through the years, uh, the American elections of 1912 and 1920, where the Socialist Party candidate Eugene Debs received over a billion votes in both of those elections. And certainly 1912 was before women had the right to vote. So you can imagine uh, how, uh, how strong the left was. The left was fundamentally altered in 1917, as our previous speaker uh, uh, indicated certainly by the impact of the Russian Revolution. Uh, the Communist Party split off from the Socialist Party, uh, and uh, it, it basically 1917 marked the beginning of the modern left in the United States. That uh, the, the 1920s were not particularly, uh, uh, were, were not a particularly decent decade for the left in the United States. Um, even by the end of the, the decade of the 1920s, the Communist Party had only 10,000 members, most of whom were members of what were called language federations at that time, like the Russian Language Federation, the Finnish Language Federation, so on and so forth. But it was really during the Depression, the American Depression uh, of the 1930s, that the left really began to grow and expand. And that continued all the way up until the end of World War I and the onset of McCarthyism uh, from my, uh, Joe, Senator Joseph McCarthy from my home state of Wisconsin. And uh, that, uh, the, the left suffered a severe blow uh, as a result of McCarthyism. Uh, and, but then again, something else happened in the mid-1960s. That is, the United States got involved in the war in Vietnam. And that war in Vietnam and the movement opposed to that war in Vietnam really was the engine that led to the resuscitation and the, the, the revitalization of the left in the United States. And it, uh, it contributed immensely uh, to the re revitalization of the left. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. So what happened uh, then was when the war in Vietnam came to a close in 1971, this had a tremendous impact upon the left. That, the, the, as I say, the movement against the war was the engine that drove the radicalization and the growth of the left. And once that war was over, the left began to decline. And it's been in the decline not since 1989, but going back to 1971, it's been a slow but precipitous uh, decline. There have been a couple of blips in that decline. Uh, that uh, there have been uh, instances where the left grew a bit. One certainly was the involvement in the movement of uh, solidarity with the people of Central America, particularly the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua. Uh, the revolution in El Salvador, so on and so forth. And certainly uh, in uh, the brief uh, opposition, brief lived opposition to the first Gulf War. But then again, the light love continued into its decline. Um, 
the political tendencies that came out of the uh, war, uh, the movement against the war in Vietnam and the radicalization there, probably the largest one was, was the Maoist tendency, which had various uh, uh, components, the Progressive Labor Party, uh, for example, uh, and uh, a couple of groups that came out of SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society. One was Bob Avakian, the Revolutionary Communist Party, and the other was uh, what we used to call the Kronskyites. <coughs> anyway, uh, uh, in the 1970s, the, the Maoist current was the, uh, the first current to really sort of dissolve as people went on with their lives, got married, got jobs. Uh, you know, you know, many of the former Maoists went into the Democratic Party, you know, still keeping a kind of progressive outlook on life, but uh, no longer considered themselves a revolutionary socialist. That revolutionary socialism was a sort of a dead end street uh, in, in uh, that instance. So I, if one looks back, and I only have a couple minutes left, I'll say, that one would have to see the template for the American left being certainly the Bolshevik Party and the Russian Revolution of October 1917. The problem was, is while the, the uh, writings of, of Vladimir Lenin and the uh, Bolsheviks in the Russian Revolution certainly corresponded to the objective needs of that time and of that place, that they, they certainly did not uh, correspond to the objective needs of the time and place in the United States. And that's been the problem, that using this template, um, most of the left organizations were patterned upon the Bolshevik party, and as such were unable to grow uh, you know, until, uh, to, into very large parties which could have an effect upon society. Uh, even the Communist Party, which was the largest party on the left in the United States, uh, only got to about 100,000 members in the year 1940, with about a million sympathizers uh, uh, as well. And so what has happened to the left today is they had to re-exam, not so much as a result of 1989, but uh, in reality, they had to re-examine what it means to be a leftist, and what kind of organizational form being a leftist should take. Uh, and that's what the challenge that's facing you know, the left today. As I say, the left is weaker than it's, uh, than it's ever been, certainly since 1877. Uh, and just unfortunately, last week, we saw one of the most uh, dynamic and vibrant and uh, viable uh, left organizations simply collapse and dissolve. And I'm speaking of the International Socialist Organization. So, my time's up. I'll pass this on. Okay. Next we have John Abbott. Hi there. Hello. Is this, can I? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, well, this might be a little choppy, let's see how it goes. Like most of you of a certain age, I well remember that startling moment from 1989 when the news broke across the airwaves that Francis Fukuyama had declared the end of history. <laughs> <laughs> On the face of it, the assertion seemed quite absurd, right? A kind of non sequitur. Of course, Fukuyama intended something rather deeper, more profound, quasi-Hegelian, According to Fukuyama, right, the triumph or apparent triumph of liberal democracy across the globe meant that history of a capital H had finally arrived through its aimless treks of human affairs onto the end phase of historical eventuation. But I think this quasi-Hegelian spin, if anything, renders Fukuyama's argument still more useful as a foil for counterargument and critique. Let's face it, on the face of it, history, in any possible sense of the term, did not close up shop in 1989. Instead, we've been sent on a very wild ride to destinations as yet unknown, as the deep structures of the Cold War gave way to polycentric improvisation. 
there was a cluster of events and trends from that time that helped, right, in ways that became clear with the passage of time, helped to establish the coordinates of this new phase of history we now live in. Uh, the first was Tiananmen Square, right, which uh, bears further discussion, I think, in the context of this panel. Um, one year before, the real first year, uh, Tiananmen Square, James Hansen provided testimony before the Senate Committee on the Environment testifying to the reality of global warming, right? An environmental challenge that initially gained some accord and consensus within U.S. ruling circles. It was not yet the highly partisan, polarizing proposition that it would become. Um, <coughs> Also in 1989, talk within European circles greatly accelerated over the project of the creating of a euro, a new currency, right? a process, a procedure, sort of anticipating the polycentric world to come <coughs> that led to the Maastricht treaties of 1992, the creation of the Eurozone, a project that's had profound ramifications, consequences, I think, for the European social welfare state. Um, Let's leave it at that for the time being. Um, starting at the top, right? Um, I, I don't think there's any question but that the collapse of the Soviet bloc represented a great blow on behalf of human freedom. I don't think there can be any regret, right, in observing the passage of these essentially, right, um, dictatorships grounded in lies and profound spiritual corruption, right? Nothing has happened since, right? The rise of Urban's Hungary or what have you, none of this calls into question that original judgment <coughs> and the importance of making it. But we live in a roughly zero-sum world, and the sad part of their story is that even though some bad guys bit the dust in 1989, other bad guys were able to maneuver out of this situation and gain new advantage, right? The appearance here was of a triumph of Western capitalism, of liberal democracy, hence the seeming credibility of Fukuyama's claim. Um, and I think what this captured was sort of a turning, a, a sort of crystallization in the ascendancy of neoliberalism in the West. Neoliberalism was nothing new to Western politics, um, right? But what we see in the aftermath of 1989 is an even f more ferocious insistence that free markets are the foundation, the prerequisite of all human freedom, that the road to freedom is the, the capitalist road, right? I mean, here again, Fukuyama's confident and complacent assertion in 1989 as to the end of history was already being actively, starkly controverted by the events of Tiananmen Square, right? Where the argument had already been made that market liberalization in China would inevitably, inexorably give rise to a flourishing democracy, right? And greater human freedom in that place. Obviously, as we now know, the nature of developments in China were very different. And the Leninist party has proven itself to be a fairly apt instrument of capitalist development. But that premise remains embedded very much, very sharply in the culture of the West. It exerts a strong gravitational force upon all the public life, I think, within Western politics. What happened after 1989 was not the uh, uh, sudden appearance of neoliberalism, but its weaponization into this very ferocious and aggressive political movement. Since 1989, we've seen the contract with America, we saw the Bush years, we saw the rise of the Tea Party, the Koch brothers and company, and now we have Trump, right? And each of these represented a kind of shock treatment, shaking up the sleepy existing status quo, ever more shifting the coordinates of American political life ever more sharply to the right. Right? And in this situation, the Democratic Party has become sort of the party of normalist restoration. It's the best that it seems to be able to hope for. But this is the logic. This is the trend. However much we um, might hold neoliberalism ourselves in contempt, I think we have to acknowledge that strategically that side is winning. 
right? And they're winning big in reshaping not only politics within the frontiers of American life, but across Europe uh, and, of course, into the former Eastern Bloc. The notion of shock treatment, right, uh, is, uh, was obviously already a well-traveled one in respect to Western policy regarding the former Soviet Union there, too, right? So the imposition of coerced neoliberal policies has created a human catastrophe that have very much has given rise, right, to the movements that we associate with Putin and uh, Orban and others. Um, insofar as Europe is concerned, right, the Euro project, it seems to me, was, is inconceivable without a kind of neoliberal consensus as having underpinned it. And through that currency system, right, we have seen a rather sharp transformation of European politics. The Social Democrats have bought into this notion for the most part and thus rendered themselves politically irrelevant, thus creating a political vacuum within European politics that more and more has been conducive to the rise of a new right. Right? But more and more, the social security state of European governance has been turned into an enforcer of capitalist discipline right? and austerity. Right? And again, this speaks again to the prevalence, the as yet still strongly embedded primacy, hegemony of these neoliberal politics. Um, what else? Added to this, of course, is that the events of 1989 essentially leveled, right, obliterated the structures of the Cold War. The structures of the Cold War had provided some restraint insofar as globalization was concerned. With the collapse of the Soviet bloc, the gloves were off and globalization now accelerated, right, in new and unprecedented ways. And that rise of globalization, again, has had profound political consequences. It's essentially eroded and undermined the national market and the national political space within which social welfare <coughs> reform could be pursued, within which collective bargaining had any meaning, right, or traction. And all of this, again, has led, I think, to um, a growing politics of shall we say, incoherence. Uh, speaking of personal history, I remember listening to Ramsey Clark speak in 1986, in which he announced that the old age of anxiety had now given way to the age of in incoherence. And at that time, there were murmurs of assent, because we all sort of intuited that there was a lot of sense to that. But none of us at that time could have possibly imagined the imbroglio that is, to, for example, today's Brexit situation within Great Britain, right? The side effects of the ascendancy of neoliberal policies and rampant globalization has been to render still more and incoherent, um, right, and sort of purposeless national, the national political spaces. It's not surprising that much of the political fire these days is centered on the right and is located within the demand to restore sovereignty conceived in national terms and moreover, uh, essentially to be pursued through anti-democratic means, right? The people of Trump in this country, the Brexiteers in Great Britain, those who are leading the charge for a restoration of national sovereignty are doing so through avowedly anti-democratic measures, right? So all of this suggests a world um, that is um, moving in interesting directions. Um, and I'm, I'm trying here to indicate at least some of the challenges that we face, of which we must be aware. Uh, to identify these ominous trends <laughs> is not to capitulate before them or to suggest that there will not be counter-movements and resistance. Um, in any event, um, a final, well, well, I'll leave it at that because I have to end. Um, and, and we have much more to talk about, and we want to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope your convention's going well, and uh, I'm really happy to be able to join you tonight and also the, with the, the other panelists. Um, it occurred to me that probably most of you were not even born, you know, at the time of uh, 1989 uh, and, the, and this uh, turning point in history. Uh, the collapse of socialism in the USSR was an enormous tragedy.
first of all, for the Soviet people who have paid an incalculable price. The nascent capitalist class, mostly former communists, in alliance with global imperialism, created, its, created itself by looting the accumulated socialist wealth. The new oligarchs established an authoritarian state in the place of Soviet socialism. And today, Russia is a rival capitalist power, seeking to expand <coughs> its global sphere of influence, challenging the dominant status of US imperialism. In spite of all the mistakes, the crimes, the violations of democracy along the way, the USSR made singular historic achievements for humankind. Soviet socialism developed under the very worst of circumstances and imaginable. From the ashes of World War I, the legacy of feudalism with its extreme backwardness, oppression, political structures, the role of the state religion, and the lack of democratic traditions and institutions. It was also shaped by hostile capitalist encirclement and civil war. With the threat of fascism rising in Germany, the Soviet Union was forced into accelerated development. And under Stalin, this forced march was combined with fear of enemies, foreign and internal, real and increasingly invented. Political differences were viewed as political threats, and the culture of uniformity prevailed. This legacy and these circumstances stunted democracy, the economy, and society, created the basis for authoritarianism, and enshrined in the Constitution the Communist Party as the sole governing party, and the development of cult of personality around Stalin. And by the time of the counter-revolution and collapse of the Soviet Union, Few, dis few defended the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, even though a majority, overwhelming majority of people supported socialism. The demise of the USSR ended that era of socialism and the model of a centralized economy, total state ownership, and the leveling of, of wages, among other things. This model and the lack of grassroots democracy were crucial factors in its downfall. Efforts to build socialism in China, Vietnam, Cuba, and even Laos all rejected this model in favor of mixed economies with strong state sectors and integration into the global economy. Even though the world has changed dramatically, these countries face similar obstacles, including underdevelopment, <coughs> hostile encirclement, constant undermining from the West, and isolation. All these countries have their own approach to democracy, rooted in their own histories and philosophies. And to one degree or another, they also come up short in terms of political pluralism, given that these societies are multi-class and so on, and guarantee of individual rights corresponding to mixed economies socially diverse societies, and tend as, you know, also towards censorship rather than rigorous public debate. I describe them as evolving democracies because they are presently undergoing reforms in civil society, legal, judicial, regulatory, and electoral structures. The most notable being the adoption of a new constitution in Cuba, a process that involves the entire nation more significant changes are yet to come with the influence of transformative social movements like the impact of the environmental movement in China. Many lessons can be drawn from the Soviet experience, and here are just a few of the ones that, I, that strike me. Number one, there are no models for the path to achieving working class political power or for socialist development. Socialist revolutions in different countries take place in different circumstances. Two, economic and political democracy and sustainability must be at the core of any socialist project to maintain the support and engagement of the people. Three, democracy must ensure collective rights and individual rights. Four, 
Humans, including revolutionaries, make mistakes, but they can be corrected, including by carrying out needed reforms if revolutionary movements promote the capacity for sober, sober self-reflection, flexibility, and avoid dogma. Five, a socialist revolution is a long historic process stretching over an epoch and doesn't occur due to an insurrection. People take time to change. Six, constant war mobilization and militarization are inhospitable to building democratic <coughs> socialism. Socialism requires peace to develop. Seven, economic isolation is inhospitable to building socialism. China's economic reforms rest on what they call an opening to the global economy. Humanity is, is at a crossroads as we gather here. We face unprecedented ex existential crises to climate and ecology and a growing nuclear war danger. We face a global crisis of wealth extremes uh, and a disruption from the oncoming technological revolution in robotics and AI. Democracy is under assault in many countries and many, I think, all of these problems in one way or another are related to capitalist development and neoliberalism and, and so on. <laughs> Humanity will be forced to reorganize society, to fully mobilize every human resource and adopt new ways of global cooperation to address these existential threats. You can just imagine, I mean, we're going to be faced, all of us will be faced with these threats for the remainder of our lives. Sea level rise on the coast, droughts, uh, you know, flooding, uh, all of these things. Society's going to have to be reorganized to, to deal with them. U.S. imperialism is a descending superpower in today's world. The ability of the U.S. and capitalist powers to define globalization and dominate the global order have been weakened. Globalization is increasingly being uh, shaped by the rise of China, emerging economies, and alternative global institutions and blocs. The multiracial American working class and people will forge our own path to socialism within this overall context. U.S. socialism will be rooted in the struggles in uh, responding to our political and social realities, including the, the struggle for democracy, uh, which uh, John talked about, and our history and democratic traditions. It will be shaped by the fight to expand economic and political democracy, to overcome social, racial, and gender inequity, to achieve a better, more secure, humane life and creative work for all of us, to pursue a sustainable path of development, and demilitarize the economy and society. <clears throat> I believe that socialism in the U.S. will be achieved peacefully and democratically through the electoral arena and the battles in multiple other arenas. In fact, Frederick Engels suggested as much in the late 1880s with the advent of the universal franchise. Quote, he said, the day of storm in the of the barricades is over. This is validated by the growing presence of democratic and socialist movements in the U.S. electoral arena and success in electing grassroots activists, including women, people of color, trade unionists, LGBTQ people, and socialists to public office. I mean, we just had an election Tuesday. We have six social democratic socialists and city council now in, in Chicago. Mass, mass engagement will reform existing democratic institutions, including election law, and create new democratic forms. It will compel the capitalist class to accept a path chosen by the majority and block any attempt to maintain power through violence. This path to socialism will be charted by the broadest, most inclusive, and diverse coalition of pro-socialist forces with shared leadership. 
the growing alliance for advanced democratic reforms and ultimately a socialist orientation is being formed now in the fight against the extreme right, the fight to defend democracy. No advanced democratic forms will be possible without the defeat of Trump and the extreme right in the 2020 elections and the election of a center left governing coalition at every level. I believe our path to socialism will be, be determined by the necessity to address existential threats of climate, ecology, and nuclear war, and the crisis of wealth extremes and social inequality. This is why the Green New Deal, an overarching vision that meets the challenges imposed by the climate crisis and wealth inequality, is so exciting. While it is not a program for socialism, it is a radical economic, structural, and social reform that if one will shift the political balance and open a new stage in the fight for green, peaceful, and democratic socialism. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Platypus for the invitation, and especially whoever chose this question. At first, I thought, I don't know that much about Germany. I don't know that much about Eastern Europe. Thanks for the invitation. I think I'll do it. And then I thought, you know what? I don't know enough to take up 10 minutes usefully. And then I looked at the question. I said, well, let's not be hasty. A chance to speak is always a good thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> but... <clears throat> The more I thought about it, I thought, this could lead anywhere. This could lead to why the ANC abrogated, broke, betrayed the program on which they had fought for many years. It could lead anywhere because it was an epic changing time. And I want to take a, it, <clears throat> a look at it from the inside, if, as it will, and see what kind of lessons exist from that time <clears throat> and from what came from it rather than try and um, impose my predetermined path of history, if you will. <clears throat> Not that I'm giving up my ideas, necessarily. Um, <clears throat> so, Germany is our taking off point. But then I looked into it, and it's like, well, <clears throat> let's go back and see what happened. Because in Germany, as in Czechoslovakia and Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe, when the, the communist governments fell, there was no repeat of what happened in 53 when the working class of Eastern Germany rose up in the streets and hundreds of thousands, maybe a million workers, mostly workers, took to the streets initially because the piecework that they depended upon, the piecework rates for pay were being increased and their standard of living was being threatened and it evolved into strike committees, coordination committees, masses coming out, and it was only put down, not by the existing government and the forces available to it, it took Soviet tanks to crush that. Just as it took Soviet tanks to crush uprisings in Czechoslovakia and Hungary. But now, in 1989, all of these popular uprisings and movements, there were no Soviet tanks. <clears throat> and I think it tells us a lot. It's important, in my opinion, because what explains that? And I think the center of the explanation is, despite all, the center of it lies in the fact, I think, that the elites who were, um, held political power, made the economic decisions in the Soviet Union, had already given up on that course for many years. I remember reading magazine articles from Eastern, that translated articles from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, trade unionists economists at all levels of the politically active elites in the Soviet Union were talking about free markets. Free market ideology had penetrated, and I think it goes back as far as Khrushchev had gave advice to some of the third world revolutions as they used to be known, and said don't follow our example, make your own path. They, the, the failures of central planning 
generated enormous hordes of jokes among the Russian people, the Soviets especially. They had central planning, they had a communist party, but they didn't have the active participation of millions of workers. Workers were reduced to following and responding to plans that were imposed, and they would get paid depending on whether they met objectives at the end of the month or the end of the year. And so you had tremendous resources put into production that had nothing to do necessarily with the actual needs, with the actual circumstances on the ground. So their leaderships, their elites, had already turned the corner. They were looking for ways out of that system when these, when these developments took place in Eastern Europe. And Gorbachev, who was trying to guide that development, made it very clear Soviet troops would not go in to obstruct them. And these regimes all fell practically without the use of any violence, without the use of any force, because they didn't have an organic basis in those societies. These regimes came as a result of the victories of the Red Army in the Second World War. And in fact, they weren't really developed until it became crystal clear that the United States had no intention of continuing its aid to the Soviet Union after the war was over, which Stalin and the Soviet leadership desperately wanted. It wasn't until, I think, 49, 1949, that they established the form of socialism or the state planning and the Communist Party holding power. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> that was half my time for an introduction. <laughs> um, so, basically what it shows us is that in contrast to what happened in China, Tiananmen Square, the Chinese, was taking place just at the time that in Poland they were negotiating with Solidarność to become a legal opposition and they had elections and the German demonstrations were underway. In the spring of 89, culminating in Tiananmen Square the night of June 3rd, June 4th, that ruling elite or ruling class headed in a clear capitalist direction, crushed an uprising of tens of thousands of students and workers. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, it's not part of popular history, but the students had gone out into the working class communities across Beijing and had thousands and tens of thousands of workers came in motorcycles and trucks because the democracy they wanted was commune. They were looking to the Paris Commune. You may have seen pictures with the Statue of Liberty, but people who were there sang the Internationale and were joining with the workers in China who were rising up because their basic security was being threatened by this turn towards capitalism. In particular, they had speed ups and they had the beginnings of taking away the fundamental uh, gains of the Chinese revolution for the workers. That is, they had guaranteed food, they had health care, they had housing, they had education, all through the state enterprises. This was being taken away. And hence, the call of the students to return to the commune, Paris commune method of democracy, met with a rising and uh, anger of the workers. The difference between the regimes was China crushed it in blood. Three to 10,000 people were killed. Massacres. All right. Um, I'm just going to skip over, just touch on. So the Cold War is over. The, the United States reigned supreme as the sole hegemon, as it was called at the time. <clears throat> the neocons said, <clears throat> we have a unique opportunity to expand the impact of American capitalism and to tear down all government restrictions on the freedom of our capital to penetrate the world. We saw this with the first Gulf War. <clears throat> And consequently, with the rise of globalization, which is continuing and accelerating the, re the destruction of all restrictions that took place from the 70s on, that Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were big proponents in laying attacks on the working class. And so we saw the growth of globalization as part of this continuing, accelerating trend, smashing all restrictions, whether it's trade unions, whether it's uh, uh, 
uh, limits on what the investment rates could be, prices, all that sort of stuff was gone. And we saw that globalization also meant that the nation states were, were coming to still be representatives for their capital. And in particular, we saw the inability of global capital to deal with its own offspring in the sense of the climate change has been discussed here before. And everybody in this room, in, as the years go on, we will see what we know we'll see. How many people here think that climate change, by the way, is real serious and a threat? Can you see your hands? Right, okay. That's what I thought. <clears throat> so, what is necessary? We <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what we're seeing is, obviously, the, if not the death row, certainly the, the diminishment and if not the destruction of globalization in its current forms. And we're seeing this all over Europe. We're seeing it in the United States. And by and large, many local capitalists and national capitalists as well as international are very happy to see some of this, not happy to see the others. What are we seeing is the rise. We're seeing in the place of the globalization, we're seeing the nationalism national controls, um, uh, what's the word I want? What's, what? Tariffs, taxes, privatization. And, and with that, we are seeing the rise of China superseding, ending this period of US domination as the sole hegemon. And in fact, we see the rise of China as a threat, not just in terms of investments. China's now got 50% of US investments of Africa up from 2% 20 years ago. And I could go on. But the Chinese model and the Chinese expansion with BRI, the Chinese expansion with their model of the internet control and the Great Firewall are proposing a, an alternative to liberal democracy. And we're seeing the challenge for your generation, because I won't be around 10, 15 years from now, but the challenge for your generation in this country and around the world is to, is to establish global picture of what the world has to be because capitalism clearly is not able to impose restrictions on emissions as one challenge. Capitalism is, as in the globalized form, has generated tremendous hardship in countries for the working class where it had relatively better conditions now worse. The popularity of the word socialism is now the main way that your generation, the generation 25, 30, 35, 40 year olds hold because of the experience of the last 10 years. And it's time to stop. Thank you. <laughs> I think just to clarify a couple of things, um, you know, we in Platypus think that highlighting some of the arguments, some of the disagreements among the left is a way that we learn, sort of clarify the way that the 20th century is being, is passed into history. Um, and so in that spirit, I know it's very tempting to um, sort of talk about the present and what could be um, to a room full of young people, and I'm sure that will continue to happen, but I wanted to sort of refocus our conversation on this issue of 1989 and how to characterize this moment. So some of the things that were brought up before I, I allow you to respond to one another. Um, this issue of 1989 is a tragedy versus a kind of an advancement of human freedom. Uh, I think there was some disagreement about that. Uh, there was this issue, Robert talked about the dreams of, a sort of passing of dreams, and whether or not those still haunt us, and in what way do they still haunt us today. Um, I think that uh, John Abbott brought up the relationship between the consolidation of neoliberalism and the end of the, the fall of the USSR. And finally, a lot of the speakers brought up this issue of democracy and whether um, democracy triumphed in 1989 or whether democracy was crushed 
right, by Soviet troops, by Soviet tanks, this kind of formulation. Um, and so, yeah, I'll open it up to our panelists. We'll have three to four minutes to respond. And I know that I brought up a lot of things. Some of this stuff might come up in Q&A. So who would like to begin? Should we do it in the order that we want? How about that? All right, Robert. Thank you. Um, it, uh, thank you very much also for the invitation. It was a great privilege to, to be in company of such distinguished um, experts in, in the area of, of thinking radically about the world we live in, um, especially over the tumultuous <coughs> period, post-war period. Um, <coughs> lifetime of my parents and, and now as a, a shockingly you know, I've become one of the, the long the old timers <laughs> looking back on this past century um, <clears throat> I don't know if I have that you know there, there are specific points that I would contend or, or support I think the one thing that um, struck me most um, was, was this idea of the politics of incoherence. Um, the incoherence that 1989 has bequeathed to us. It's especially stark, I think, in, in Eastern Europe. When you mentioned Orban in Hungary, we could talk about um, the Polish situation. For me, the Russian situation is, is most familiar and most um, troubling. What we see there, in my view, is is a kind of um, retreat from ideology. And ideology has a bad name in the world generally, but I, I think looking back at 1989, we see some of the, the benefits of ideology, the need for ideas, uh, for a coherent, at least, as, as the last speaker said, picture of, of what we want for our world. And <clears throat> In Eastern Europe, the, the, the um, withdrawal of, of this future horizon, as illusory as it might have seemed in the, under Brezhnev, for example, in a, especially under Brezhnev's um, uh, successes, it has left people with this um, very atavistic focus on, on a mythic past, a mythic past of of struggle, of, um, of trauma. Um, we saw it explode in the Yugoslav Wars, which weren't mentioned here, but th that was the most spectacular manifestation of it. It seemed an aberration, and yet that kind of atavistic nationalism not only has become the norm in Eastern Europe, but has even now spread to the United States. It's, you know, this, this withdrawal of ideology has become attractive even <laughs> to those who, who were, thought they were beyond ideology, not only beyond history. And so, <clears throat> I'm not a coherent thinker in, in that sense. I, I don't have a picture of what I want for the world. Although I, I agree, there's, there's something that, uh, like um, a Green New Deal that it has a very powerful uh, attraction to the, to the imagination. I mean, we know how it's going to go down in mainstream America, probably. You know, the suburbs with the lawns and the SUVs, and you know, it's not going to fly. But it might um, energize a certain population somewhere in the country, and, and that would already be a good thing to present some kind of coherence in response to this, uh, to my mind, very troubling incoherence. So, hmm. does that count as a response? <laughs> well, I think all the other panelists, uh, you know, gave some, you know, extremely interesting, uh, 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 made some extremely interesting points in, in their remarks, and uh, uh, they have made a, a real contribution to a discussion that needs to be ha uh, had. Uh, for my own uh, part, I think that. Uh, I think that we would be much better advised not to look back to 1989 
because what happened in 1989 happened. And uh, we are all aware that it happened. We may have differences as to why it happened, but really the focal point really has to be the year 2019 and beyond. That is what the challenge is now, not analyzing what happened in 1989. And so we have to think uh, of how we're going, which we, what we should be doing to go forward uh, in the uh, coming uh, decades. That we have to take a look and, and understand <coughs> what the situation is. Uh, there is an ideology today. It's the ideology of the ruling class, and that has prevailed. Uh, we hear it all the time. We hear it about free markets. Uh, we hear, we hear the mantra of neoliberalism. That is the ideology that has prevailed, and then we have to have a counter ideology to that. And uh, the Green New Deal is a component of that ideology. But it was what is really needed in the year two, uh, 2019 and beyond is political independence. What we have here, particularly in the United States, are two capitalist parties. One is the Republicans, and that's obvious. People can tell that. But the other is the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is a capitalist party, too. And uh, that we have to... What that means that if there are two capitalist parties, major parties here in this country, that if there is going to be any change whatsoever, that means that there has to be political independence developed uh, from the two parties that presently exist. You know, just as Eugene Debs and the people in the past, in, in 1912 and 1920, you know, developed the Socialist Party, uh, and uh, in, in, in other countries where you do have independent parties. Uh, still, some are more independent than others, but you do have a Labour Party in England. You have a new Democratic Party in Canada. Uh, you don't really have that to speak of in the United States, and that is a challenge in the coming period. I know it's difficult to say, because in 2020, people are going to say, you know, anybody but Trump. Yeah, we got to support the Democrats because otherwise we're going to have Trump for four more years. But that's really, um, that uh, may well be the case. And people can go into the ballot box and, you know, vote for whoever uh, they want to. But in terms of uh, the political reality, that uh, there has to be an independence from these two parties in the development of at least another political expression to be able to really convey all of the kinds of things that the other panelists have talked about, whether this be climate change and how to cope with it, or uh, how to deal with the tremendous disparity between the 1% of wealth in this country and the 99% of people who are not wealthy. So those are some of the considerations, but I think that the, uh, underlying all of this is a look forward and not a look back. Okay, a um, couple of impressions. Um, I, I think, yes, we saw a collapse of illusions in 1989 and I think that was a good thing. Um, there were tragedies in that story. I remember being in East Berlin um, and watching the act of colonization of the former East Berlin by the Vessies, right, as they came in and displaced personnel. And, you know, you had a whole generation that suddenly had to confront the, the idea, the proposition that their entire lives had been a lie, right, and had no value and had no place within the new scheme of things. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we can certainly sort of acknowledge, right, that sense of loss, uh, even as we celebrate, I think, the passage of an apparatchik state that was, again, profoundly corrupt spiritually and materially. Um, I think the idea of the end of ideology is a challenging one. I am sort of usually at pains to, to not be particularly ideological. 
I find it to be sort of a straitjacket, right, uh, that I usually try to avoid. But I think there is a problem here. And the way I've always seen it is I've always been struck by the raw nihilism of America's right and the nihilism that extends to Vladimir Putin and that kleptocracy, and it's the exercise of power for its own end. And again, what's sort of, sort of striking about America's neoliberal right is the anti-government nihilism on the one hand harnessed to this ferocious will to power on the other. Right? It's an inherently unstable, destabilizing proposition. But you know, it, I think it, it is part of sort of the assault upon community, assault upon um, civil society that requires an answer. Um, and wherein that lies, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I think, I think we have to identify those truths that we hold to be self-evident, right? Uh, and, and we have to be clear and firm and principled in that. Um, well, um, and, and, and I think we have to recapture a, a language that's capable of speaking of the common good and of a public interest. Just one last thought, which has nothing to do with the, just the most recent remarks. The, the other thing that might be said here is that, I mean, we're all kind of coming out of this vaguely ecumenical socialist background. <laughs> and we right, noted a moment in the evolution of capitalism where socialism, uh, where, where capitalism itself introduces incredibly social character to labor and to production, right? People working in factories of thousands of people thrown together, right? Mature capitalism has atomized and individualized labor to a shocking degree, right? Mature capitalism has created the gig economy. It has led people through social media to the project of monetizing their personality as a means of getting over. Uh, I mean, there is something in this moment, right, that I think we also have to identify. And this is, I think it's part of, so, so, so here's my final point. Alongside sort of the loss of ideals, there's a sense of a loss of community. And we have to find the means and the practices so as to recreate a real sense of community based upon cosmopolitan, tolerant, liberal values, as opposed to all this atavistic shit, right, that is, that's passing for an ersatz community ethic at this moment in history. <laughs> so those are some of the issues to address. Thank you. Wow, there's a lot to talk about here. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll just I'll just uh, say a few words about because I agree kind of that you know 2019 is my is what I'm looking at and uh, you know drawing the lessons from the past but you know we we live in a different world and um, you know as a Marxist you know or I don't know everybody's philosophy but you know you try to interpret uh, developments today through that lens and. And how you can, uh, you know, change uh, society and uh, through, uh, you know, through that uh, outlook. <clears throat> you know, I, I feel as though the left and ideas of socialism are more prevalent today than in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, it wasn't long ago that you could even utter that word. Uh, it was, you couldn't talk about socialism in the United States for uh, 50 years or more. And it wasn't until, you know, Bernie's campaign uh, where there was a mass public discussion about socialism, you know, that broke through that. Um, and that's really profoundly democratic, you know, to be able to, to say that there is a different future. You know, there is an alternative to capitalism. Uh, and for millions of people, tens of millions of people, to be able to, to uh, think about that, to discuss it, to let that sink in, and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it, it, this, thing, this development had already occurred from uh, the polling that I saw, you know, already in 2010. This is before Bernie even ran. So, you know, you had over half of the Democratic Party activists who felt that... Um, you know, socialism was a better society, you know, than capitalism already. 55%, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and the highest percentages among African-American and uh, young people, of course. Um, 
But that was already in 2010, you know, on, on the heels of the great financial crisis of 2008 and how people were reacting, you know, to all of that. Um, but this is, this is a huge component of this upsurge that we're a part of, you know, the Me Too movement, the whole fight against Trump, and so on. on in every movement, the left and socialists are active and giving really great leadership, you know. Not everybody obviously sees it the same way. Um, they have different conceptions of what that means, you know, what socialism means. Uh, there's all kinds of ideas, which is, you know, which is fine. And, these discussions and, and, and debates, you know, go on, but at least it points in a direction, you know, points in an important direction. Um, and this idea that, uh, I better stop, I don't want to go over this time. Uh, you know, this movement is also a movement of values. It's a movement of community. It's a movement of of um, ethics and morals, it's, as Reverend Barber says, you know, this is a moral movement, you know, that we're building. Um, and those are really important things because in the seeds of today's movement is the society of, of tomorrow. I'll leave it at that. Well, let me start by disagreeing <laughs> in the most agreeable way I can. Um, the idea that the U.S. ruling class will give up power based on pe peaceful elections seems to me absurd. Given the violence, especially that this ruling class has engaged in since the beginning of the colonies and the extermination of masses of people and destroying everything above ground in North Korea and endless I think the United States has been at war for something like 90%, 95% of the time that, that, it, we, that it has existed. I don't like to say we. This is one of the most violent societies, one of the most violent ruling classes that we've seen. I don't know, maybe in history. More people killed. Anyway, the idea that they're going to give up power because they could lose an election seems to me absurd on the face of it. It's perhaps insulting. I don't mean it as personally insulting. But politically, I think you'd be insane to follow that idea. Or suicidal, perhaps. Um, the idea, it seems to me that what we call for is a response to the conditions that have evolved since the fall of the Soviet Union and what used to be called the Soviet <coughs> bloc. One, climate is a global issue. It, it doesn't matter where you are. Therefore, it calls for a global response. Capitalism has not been able to form a global response. It's a joke. Yeah, there's hundreds of billions of dollars that are being invested in green um, energy. But the idea of curtailing the right of capital to invest and proceed is non-existent. The Paris Accords, if you read them or read a summary of them, are a joke. It's a public relations fraud. There's not one ounce of applicable power to force anything. Nothing. The Green New Deal, likewise, for all of the job and other proponents, the Green New Deal says zero about stopping the use of coal, oil, gas and etc. It's a jobs program just like FDR's WPA. Yeah. It did not solve the, the problems economically in the 30s. That was World War II. And this Green New Deal will not touch one ton of, of carbon going into the air. Is it a good thing in many ways? Sure. Is it anything solution to the actual problem? And oh no, not a bit. It's all within the realm of capitalist competition and, and market strategies. Oh, lovely. <laughs> um, God, I love getting these notes. Um, so basically, I think from the tasks that life gives us is what's called for is, if you will, a return to revolutionary communism. My friend is wrong when he says you couldn't talk about socialism. I was part of a wing of SDS. We had a thousand 
people in a caucus based on the idea that students should align with the working class and that the working class was the only source of potential socialism and communism for the United States and the world was global. So it can be done, but it won't be done by swinging sweet nostrums and singing lullabies, but to recover the democratic uh, power of the working class that has to be actively involved. A party, a state, and nationalized property and a plan is not socialism. It's not a way to communism. If the working class is not actively involved at different layers and more and more, you cannot have a successful transformation of bourgeois relations. Thank you. Um, could I have the mic? Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to go into the Q&A portion. I saw already a couple of hands. I see you, Richard. Um, Kruger and O'Mare. All right, we're gonna uh, start just one at a time. This is the only microphone that we have. So should we just share this microphone? Yeah? Okay, all right. Richard? Hi. Um, so uh, the date of the fall of the Berlin Wall, November 9th, was also the 71st anniversary of the fall of the Wilhelmine Reich, and also the 51st anniversary of Kristallnacht. But we had a panel on the German Revolution last night. So you speak about an ecumenical socialist tradition, but Friedrich Ebert was a socialist, Luske and Scheidemann were socialists, Luxembourg and Liebknecht were socialists, you know, Ledebour, Haidta, and Kautsky. So there were socialists murdering other socialists. And those socialists who were killing the other socialists were doing so in the name of democracy, right? So maybe we shouldn't be talking in the language of an ecumenical socialist tradition, right? Because that seems to me, in many respects, an illusion if you look at like the history of the 20th century, right? That Walter Ulbricht was a socialist. So the question is, what kind of socialism do we want? Right? Or that seems to me a fundamental question. And I would be interested in how you see a connection with the revolutionary moment, not just of 1917 in Russia, but also the German Revolution, uh, in terms of the later history. I think what we'll do, since we have one microphone, is that if you're next on the stack, just come up here so that we can then put the mic back. So next on the stack is Omer. Um, and then Gregor. So uh, just a reminder, since we're gonna take a lot of questions from the audience, it's not that everyone up here has to answer, if we can move it, move it on, but if you'd like to answer, please go ahead. Pam, can you ask the people, if, if they have a question for a specific person, could they direct Yes, them? please say if you have a question for a specific person. Earl? No, no, no. I just met people oh. from the audience. My, my question I, was directed at anybody. Does right. anyone want to answer this question? Oh. To the question okay. Nobody wants to answer your question. Uh, why don't we take a bunch? I think yeah. we're going to do one at a time we're because we find that it gets lost. Okay. So. okay, okay, okay. Of course, there are assholes who are socialists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. what, do you, what do you really think, Pat? <laughs> I mean, what the hell? <laughs> anybody familiar with the uh, with the history of socialism knows that socialists, or people call themselves socialists, were the ones who had Rosa Luxemburg killed. You know, yes. We know that someone who considered himself a socialist, Joseph Stalin, had Leon Trotsky assassinated. Yes, we're aware of all that sort of thing. So it's not, uh, we're not being ecumenical socialists in, in, in the regard that you uh, suggest. Yeah, we, we, there are uh, individuals who have been socialists that we can certainly identify with and, and, uh, and, and hail, such as Eugene Debs, just uh, to name one, and there are many, many others. So, uh, because there are, uh, are some bad apples, doesn't mean that the whole barrel is rotten. Okay, come in. The, 
this isn't really about 1989, but it's about neoliberalism, which keeps coming up. And part of me just is thinking, well, what are we talking about, mm -hmm. right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of, so we have the kind of Reagan revolution idea of neoliberalism as the right, free markets, austerity against what is posed as the New Deal, as a kind of equitable, dem democratic form. Well, what that elides, I think, to push on kind of Earl's kind of contention is that there was actually a left-wing critique of the welfare state, right? In some sense, that you could say was a predecessor in neoliberalism. You know, one example is Foucault, who relates the kind of authoritarianism of the psychological mm -hmm. system with the welfare state, mm -hmm. with FDR, in ways in which he then tagged as a neoliberal, right? So you have a kind of critique of the welfare state coming from the left, but now the welfare state is kind of espoused as the left again mm -hmm. in response to you know, the neoliberalism in ways in which it seems to be this back and forth, right? There's a critique of the welfare state that leads to neoliberalism and what happens again is a kind of reappraisal of the welfare state as the best way forward. So doesn't the welfare state, the kind of the resurgence of the welfare state, in some sense have to pay heed to the critique of the welfare state that Neil have to offer? Bring it up here, dude. Okay, thank you. Anyone want to answer this? <laughs> Who's for the welfare state? I am. Okay. Well, I'm not. And I'll tell you why. Because that just shouldn't be you know, the goal that we aspire to. We want uh, not a welfare capitalist state, a good, kind, you know, fuzzy capitalism. That's what the welfare state is. And that's what the Social Democrats did in Europe and, and uh, elsewhere in the globe. We want a completely new type of society, a socialist society, not a welfare state. So and, maybe it's about the people who are talking about Green New Deal more. I see your critique, but what about the Green New Deal? Isn't that a guy that's it, it, it today, today, people who are socialists, revolutionary socialists, who want an overturn of capitalism, can't support reforms in the present context. You don't want to be ridiculous in that regard. You can support reforms, but know that reforms are in and of themselves not the ultimate goal. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I raised my hand in support of the welfare state because I think that re reforms would elevate our way of life, sort of, pull many people out of this doggy dog competitive existence, enable them to see a little further or a little higher. Um, my problem is this, if you really call yourself a democratic socialist, you can't have it both ways. You can't insist upon a system that outlaws any form of capitalist activity on the one hand and say that you're a democrat on the other. It was a recent dispute I had with some people over Scandinavia, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll cop to it. I, I think Scandinavia represents a much better way of life, by and large, than what we have here. But there was also legislation recently in Denmark that was really seriously chauvinist and directed against Muslim immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so the question came up, how, Scandinavian socialism sucks, because this is what people are doing. And I think we have to disaggregate those issues of policy. There's nothing in the welfare state that guarantees that people are going to be decent to one another. right? But if we take seriously the idea of democracy, we also have to take seriously the, our task is not simply to coerce or suppress those untoward emanations of a human spirit, but rather to enlighten, to persuade, and yes, where, net, where possible and necessary to suppress. Right? But we have to do that within the evolving democratic consensus that is at hand. We have to work with the human resources that actually are presented. Right? We can't just simply say that socialism, by instituting a certain set of socioeconomic reforms, is going to solve questions of chauvinism and the like. Right? The experience of the Soviet Union certainly will show that. Um, Right? Uh, any, any number of actual existing socialisms were rife with all kinds of nasty social and chauvinist currents. So I think to a certain degree, conceptually, we have to disaggregate these issues. And this is what I mean when I talk about an ecumenical socialism. I'm not talking about an alternate theology. I'm not talking about a notion of an end goal in which we are going to push to the other side and that will be our end of history. 
It ain't ever going to happen like that. There's always going to be contradiction. There's always going to be dispute. There's always going to be argument, right? But I would much rather we did so on the basis of meaning of, of a state that actually provided for the needs of the majority of people, that equalized opportunity and the like. And that's where my version of ecumenical socialism comes from. Does that make sense? So yeah, I mean, I, in a sense, that's also, yeah, I don't dispute Foucault's point, right? But in, to me, that in and itself doesn't invalidate the, the value of social reform. Right? That's not tantamount to the whole project of human liberation. Right? We can disaggregate, separate these things out. Right? We should. That's my point. Thank you. Who wants to talk? Thank you. Earl. Earl. Did you want to go? Go ahead. To the extent that I understand what you're saying, <laughs> which is limited, I'm sure, <laughs> especially from my previous interactions with the platypus. I know very well that there's a different language and a mindset that I just run into parts of, so I, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I think that what we see with the welfare state, first of all, they're failing. They're transforming. Sweden hasn't been a fully social democratic society for many, many years. The Labour Party there has instituted cuts to education and many benefits. The social compact between the private sector and the public sector is largely breaking down. So I don't think that's our future. I think the future is much more bleak and much more stark. And that is the competition of capital around the world is increasing, the forms are changing, and the challenge is to have a, a democratic communist party, if you will, that projects in all areas of life the contradictions that actually exist, and they are everywhere, right? It's not about imposing and saying, here's my however many treatises Martin Luther put on the wall. It's not about that. It's about taking from within each situation the actual elements, both class and otherwise, and bringing them to the fore and developing class conscious people who can see that because that is the only solid basis that capitalism gives us for not just resistance, but transformation. And in terms of the discussion, the point that was made earlier about uh, atomization of capital, mature capitalism, yes, definitely. I've, all the factories I ever worked in are all gone in Chicago. 1,000 people, 1,500, small, smaller factories, all gone. <coughs> Industries gone, skills gone, disappeared. But even in Amazon, which has got these hugely automated, onerous, target people to the second, everybody is, is, is watched and has technology, even there, there was a walkout in Minneapolis, what, a week ago? How many people here are familiar with that, aware of it? Yeah. A lot of those workers were Somali refugees, and so the nature of the changing nature of the working class and what people from around the world bring is not just language and nice, interesting foods, but they bring experience and struggle that's much more raw and brutal than what we have here. And it's a damn good reason to welcome immigrants, and, but on a class-conscious basis rather than pity these poor people. Those people coming up from Honduras know a lot about American imperialism. They know a lot. They, it's been seared into their brains and blood. So if we're going to take a stand on immigration, let's take a class-conscious stand and say, our brothers and sisters have the great gifts to bring to us, and we have the same enemy, and we have the potential for the same future. I'll stop. Uh, you know, just real quickly, because I know there's other questions. Um, I'm glad you revealed your vulnerabilities. I, I, I hope I can address your question, um, but uh, what, it, what, it, what strikes me is that, in terms of the welfare state, that you know, represented uh, gains that were won by, you know, the working class of these countries. And, um, you know, uh, these are, these gains, as we know, under capitalism are temporary and you have to fight like hell to maintain them uh, wherever you are. Um, and, 
even here, you know, we and, and it's the basis I think where a lot of people who consider themselves socialists or democratic socialists, you know, they kind of look to these Scandinavian <coughs> societies, uh, you know, as the model. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, obviously socialism is more sy systemic, it's working class power and, and so on. So it goes way beyond that. Um, but nevertheless, these policies are really important policies for any socialist society. I mean, when you talk about free universal health care, talk about uh, free universal education, uh, social security and retirement security, um, free child care, you know, those kinds of things. Those are all, you know, basic, fundamental to uh, any kind of socialist society. Um, but I think part of the attack on them is this notion that they are welfare, that they are, um, people are, that they're entitlements. You know, there's kind of this idea, this goes to Lukács and who's the Republican uh, linguist who, you know, is able to turn a phrase and uh, turn something like a, a right into uh, entitlement. an entitlement, right? So I think that that's the whole struggle we're engaged in now is how to defend these things. Um, and uh, how to not only defend them, but how to, how to deepen them and to get to the root of the fight in, 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 in uh, society as a whole. I'm putting myself on the stack here, um, hopefully to try to do some translating of our questions. Um, I guess I... I think one of the questions that people today in the present in 2019 have of socialists, people that consider themselves to be part of the social democratic tradition at large, leftists, is how did we get here? And what do we have to say about the history of the present? Um, and so I guess I'm curious by the proposition that what we had in the 20th century was just like, you know, just some bad apples. Um, and, and that that's how we should think about the, the past of socialist politics. And, um, and so I, I guess I'm a, a little bit at a loss as to why we, or maybe the panel doesn't consider um, the kind of history of the left to be an important topic to um, try to uncover today. I guess that's, you know, maybe it's a meta question. Um, because in asking what 1989 means for the left, we're asking how does the history of the left bear upon the present, right? Um, we're not antiquarians. We're trying to make sense of the past in order to give ourselves a history from where to move on from. Um, yeah, so what about 1989? Is it, oh, no, yeah. She's asking all of us. Yeah, no, I know, I'm just, I'm, you threw me for a loop with that last question. Uh, how, 1989 in what sense? There was, there was this resistance to thinking about 1989 historically, and I was just trying to translate that the reason why we asked the question That's this right. way was not so much to be antiquarians and to sort of find out what happened, but how we think about it as leftists, how, what does the date mean for the present? Um, what, how do we consider the history of the left for the present? And 1989 seems to be a closing okay. chapter of the 20th century. Okay, I'm sorry. And so we're trying to figure out with this panel, um, what are the different perspectives that the left has on 1989 and how it informs your idea of socialist values, of your practice, um, maybe I'll just leave this question here, unless Robert, do you have an answer? Please have an answer, Robert. <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, it's just, uh, this is related to something that I've been thinking about listening to my co-panelists here, um, which is that we, it, it, when you look at the history of radical for at least the particular thinkers that I work with most. Um, there's this recurring idea that socialism requires a, a very low-level grassroots or self-organization, organization 
a very small scale. Um, that's the, the Paris Commune, that's the, the Soviets in 1905 and then again in 1917. Someone like Guy Debord, um, who, about whom I was thinking as a critic, state or a, 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 a controlling state um, from the left returns to this idea of the, you know, the Soviets. And, you know, and somehow I think that 1989 should um, alert us to the utopian nature of that particular model. Um, here for the first time possibly we had a liberation struggle that that in fact rejected that, it rejected the kind of grassroots socialist um, organization, and actually moved to integration with the neoliberal world order, integration with the European Union very quickly. And even Gorbachev in, in the late 80s was talking about the Soviet Union surviving by joining this common European whole, kind of EU plus USSR. It didn't last long. You know. I mean, the idea, but it, it was it was there, um, and I so I feel that uh, 1989, this which has been called this carnival, sorry, you know, this, but carnival of the nations, mm -hmm. um, again appealing to a an, an old even pre-modern image of, of uh, emancipatory behavior, requires a new kind of image of self-organization, organization, um, especially with uh, in, in the digital age. And I personally have no, no, no suggestions for what that might be. But um, it does kind of grate with me a little bit to hear everyone constantly go back to the, the Soviets of 1905, these very fleeting moments of Berlin. When, when I think 1989 put an end to that and, and requires a different imaginary, a different revolutionary imaginary. Does anyone want to shoot me down? No, I want to build you up. <laughs> <laughs> I do agree. I, I think um, thinking about, and um, <coughs> Pam, thanks for bringing the focus back. It forces me to, uh, to, to, if I were to answer that, well, I will. I'll respond anyway, I won't answer it. Uh, I think it was terrible and wonderful, basically, 1989. It showed, it was terrible in the sense that tens of millions of people around the world, for better or worse, looked to the Soviet bloc as an alternative to American-led imperialism. Looked to the Soviet bloc for the aid that it gave to the colonial peoples in Africa and around the world and that stayed the hand of the blood-drenched Western imperial powers. And those things were true. They did. At the same time, it stripped away the mask and showed that it was basically hollow because they wouldn't fight to defend their system, for one thing. They couldn't because the internal contradictions in the Soviet Union as I understand them, was that the leadership had been disassociated, more than disassociated, had smashed the independent attempts of working class people to have a say in the direction of society. The working class was forcibly excluded from power for generations, and that led them to a system where they were trying to control through administrative means, but they didn't have the active political, ideological, theoretical, <coughs> and organizational participation of the masses of people who were working there. They did not. Hence, it collapsed. So even though it's terrible in the earlier sense, it's a wonderful opportunity. No, it's a necessity. It's not an opportunity. It's forced upon us to come up with a different way of understanding transformation, revolution, party, and yet the working class is still there. The working class is fighting. There are sections. How many people here are familiar with the, what's it called? Uh, the, 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 Iran, the, work, the Worker Communist Party of Iran. How many people here are familiar with that? Iraq? No, Iran. Two, three, four. The two, or? 
No, not two to two to seven each on the left. Um, I would advise you, uh, urge you to go out and look for revolutionary movements and currents in the working class around the world. They're developing, they're struggling, just as people here, I hope, are, are with the same goal. We can keep going this back if that's all right. So I have here uh, Gregor, then Jacob, then Jan. Um, I have a question that goes back to Patrick's opening remarks, um, and they might tie in with something that then John added, um, brought up in his opening remarks. Uh, I found the historical narrative, Patrick, that you um, drew up in your opening remarks uh, kind of fascinating. I, I thought it did address the question where you said 1989 is kind of like an anticlimactic fiddling out of a leftist history that had already been in, in a long, arduous process of dying. Um, and so I found it interesting that in the context of the American Revolutionary tradition, you sort of point at the high point to between 1877 and 1920, um, and sort of detected ever since then a gradual decline. Now, where you said that the left had its momentary peaks again since then was in 19, with, with the Vietnam War and then with the resistance to um, the American crushing of the Sandinistas, but those are very reactive um, form of uh, resistant politics. It's no longer clear what the, where the optimism and where the future sort of ideals uh, lay that would have been expressed in such a context. So between 1877 and 1920, you have the Socialist Party advocating for socialism and hoping for a, a progressive uh, improvement of, of the society. In, in the 60s and 70s, you have resistance to Vietnam. How is that uh, being on the left? You know, you had you had conservative critiques and conservative uh, resistance to the Vietnam War, and so if I think about sort of the left post 1989, or what is understood as a left, it's again something that conservatives kind of can probably agree to, which is yeah, the threat of uh, run, uh, runaway greenhouse effect, um, but a leftist position is purely expressed in highly pessimistic and, and, and reactive ways, which is. Uh, the, the ideal of millennial socialism, Ocasio-Cortez, can only rally young people to socialism by telling them socialism means, well, well, climate change will destroy the planet in 12 years, and that's why you're a socialist. There's no optimism inherent to that that I can detect. There's no sort of inspiring vision. There's a purely reactive form, so it's not quite clear to me what is leftist or socialist about such politics. Well, you, you pose, a, you pose a, uh, a very good question. And you really have to have a positive alternative, a, 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 a positive vision of, of where to go, how to go forward. Uh, the left, the left uh, I, I, if, I, if you think that I, I said that the left had its high point before World War I, that's not really true. Yeah, the left in the United States had its largest impact during the 1930s. There's no question about that. But uh, there were no socialist parties uh, getting anywhere near uh, the number of votes, which was more than a million, that Eugene Debs did in 1912 and in 1920. That's true. Uh, and since, uh, really, since, uh, uh, the, the 20th century uh, uh, began, you had the two major parties in the United States you know, essentially preempting everything else and not really leaving very much space for any kind of uh, uh, alternative uh, uh, vision of society. So uh, I think that uh, you're, you're absolutely right that you have to have a positive vision and you have to put forward uh, a notion of what you uh, what you aspire uh, for, what you what <coughs> direction you're going toward, uh, and it can't be entirely reactive uh, in, in any uh, in any respect. I think that's what, uh, incidentally, I think that's what uh, that Bernie Sanders was able to do uh, with uh, presenting uh, you know at least a partial program. Uh, they're primarily reformists, uh, re reforms that Bernie is calling for, 
but uh, that's what did galvanize a lot of people, and it gave uh, at least the notion of socialism, you know, a good name. It meant that it was something that you could talk about and discuss, and and uh, and really try to determine what socialism meant, as opposed to uh, the prevailing uh, society, which is capitalism. John, uh, before you answer, um, you kind of outlined the last, what I would uh, think would be the last optimistic uh, vision to emerge um, in the 20th century, you, uh, namely neoliberalism, something that was self-consciously predicated on progress and the expansion of freedom and so forth. Now, granted, that might not turn out that way, but um, it seems that, uh, you brought that up, and that it struck me that was the last sort of new novel form of, of expressing freedom in the 20th century that you well, I, I think it presents a, a, a road of enchainment through empowerment. I mean, I, my view of all the ideologies out there today, the one that has the most terrifying totalitarian quality is right-wing liber uh, uh, um, uh, libertarianism, as put forth by the Koch brothers and company. It's essentially an eradication of the public sphere. It's eradication of any public option, of any sense of shared communal values or social activity. It is a complete atomization of the individual and the monetization and commodification of the individual in all of our interactions with one another. And basically it means the unalloyed triumph of the economy over society it destroys and eradicates the social and creates a kind of dictatorship of the economy as achieved through a vastly recast state, right? In which privatization, right, determines everything. I mean, if, I mean this all is, is, is sort of general rhetoric, but if you look at privatization of public education, if you look at privatization of the university system, if you look at privatization of the VA, Right, you will find consistently right, a, a, a similar outcome that means in the end we have no recourse to this. There is no accountability in this world. Right? It's all, accountability itself is no longer social, it's no longer public, it's private. And to me that is the most terrifying of all the, liberta of all the ideological visions that are out there. And again, sure, it's, uh, it, libertarianism has been sold to people through the idea of empowerment, right? You don't need a pension plan, right? Run your own 401k, right? Um, nothing has sold the American public more avidly, I think, upon the identification of their own interest <coughs> in that of capitalism than the, in the elimination of pension plans and the creation of privatized pension accounts, right, in this kind of way. Mm -hmm. So that was the one point. The other reason why I had asked for the, the mic was, I mean, I do kind of object to the, the, the treatment of the green imperative as, a, as purely reactive or narrow. Um, and I, I, I think, to me, that is actually the most important sort of ideological challenge, if you will, of our day, pol political challenge. Uh, the... Um, prospect of continued environmental de degradation and catastrophe is, is imminent, is real. The building of borders right now, right, throughout various parts of the world is as much due to the droughts that have been incurred through swaths of Africa and elsewhere as political instability or warfare, and that's a growing trend, right? Uh, here's the final point, is that already a lot of people live a green lifestyle but it's essentially depoliticized. It's all a matter of individual choice. I think joining right, that green lifestyle that's already been adopted by so many people to a more aggressive political program right, that, that addresses the larger question posed by the green challenge um, would be a really powerful movement in the right direction. And the Green New Deal is a part of that, but it's not all of it. Yeah, just a real quick. Yeah, just a reminder, um, we have five people on staff. Oh, yeah, I'm about sorry. 20 no, minutes, okay. But please go ahead. Just want to let you all know the status quo is now. Sure. Yeah, just, well, just real quickly, because I, I had the same reaction. Um, you know, I think the, uh, at least to me, the Green New Deal is a extremely exciting and, and um, inspiring, you know, vision. Um, and it addresses, I think that it, it addresses, uh, you know, the real needs, you know, of uh, what we're faced with, um, 
And I think a lot of people, I'm sure, were envisioning this dystopian future, you know. Uh, and in, in, in its place now, we have a vision, and it's, it's an overarching vision that allows for really tens of millions of people to unite together and struggle. And that's what, that, to me, that, that's the source of a lot of optimism. When you get millions of people fighting together and struggle and winning um, and moving in a similar direction, that's real optimism. And that's, uh, but to be able to address those, you know, that, uh, this crisis in this way. And it's, it's I mean, it, it is really, if you've read, I mean, I, I assume everybody here has read it, read the resolution. It goes into some, you know, has some incredible proposals, uh, which I won't go into now, but, you know, just the conversion to uh, a sustainable energy source uh, is a revolutionary thing for our society itself, um, or uh, the transit system, you know, uh, that kind of thing. These are really revolutionary things that get at a lot of how we're organized and how we produce in society, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And this thing is now... Uh, you know, an overarching vision and something that millions of people uh, are supporting. Yeah, I know we have people coming. I just want to make one thing. I think this question of where does optimism come from, I don't know if that's the way you put it, but that's how I hear it. I think it comes from exactly confronting things like the climate change, which is so destructive and will become increasingly so, and we all know it. <coughs> and it's a perfect example of what needs to be done is not just to say fight climate change, but to fight climate change and preserve what we can towards a livable future requires an international order, a new international order. Requires it. Cannot be done. I don't, if every country in the world had a Green New Deal, we're still going to hell. I'm not against it. But if I'm, no, no, no. I, I just mean I'm not against the Green New Deal. I wouldn't advocate saying I'm against that. We should oppose it. But we should also be able to say, look at the limitations and the fundamental inability of this to confront what needs to be done. And what needs to be done requires a new world order, if you will, in which collaboration, cooperation, the participation of the vast majority for producing what we need in, in based on our understanding of our resources, not on the basis of what's private wealth accumulation. That's a vision of the future that opens the door to changing all kinds of social relations. Because now we no longer have capitalists in power. We don't have power serving capitalist social relations. And that is the only cause for hope there is, I think. Um, let's take two at a time, since we're running out of time. We have after um, Danny and Aaron. Um, with the collapse of the ISO in mind, I was wondering if anybody on the panel uh, <clears throat> thought that the legacy of uh, Trotskyism had anything to offer for the future, or did Trotskyism's prospects collapse uh, in 1989 with its objective critique? Hmm. I wanted to point to the undertitle of, of the panel, End of History, and uh, it was um, brought up in, in, in the opening remarks, uh, Fukuyama. Hmm. Um, and the question of, uh, I mean, history in the, in the sense of a narrative, of history, a coherent narrative of, let's say, the last 250 years. And before uh, 1989, uh, Marxists especially uh, made sense of it as a continuum. And uh, it's been done less so. And my question is uh, whether it's desirable or even uh, possible for the left to have a uh, um, narrative of the last 250 years. <laughs> well, I, I don't think that the collapse of the ISO uh, negates uh, the contribution of Trotskyism whatsoever. I mean, the ISO has uh, been around for what, 15, 20 years. Uh, started out with 80 people. Yeah, we were about 1,500. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it 
it's uh, really uh, it's demise, you know, has nothing to do with uh, you know, it's uh, with, with Leon Trotsky. Um, 18, uh, 1989, on the other hand, really confirms Trotsky's analysis of the Soviet Union, and to that Trotsky did in fact predict that the Soviet Union was going to continue in the same manner that it was after uh, Stalin uh, seized uh, control after the death of uh, Vladimir Lenin. If that was to continue, that ultimately the society uh, would would collapse, and uh, that's what what happened. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't think that that it's a uh, negation of uh, Trotsky's views uh, at all. Anyone else? Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. I'm not a Trotskyist. I've never been a Trotskyist. I won't be a Trotskyist. But, <laughs> but. Trotsky made some great contributions, in my opinion, one of which was counterposing the idea of the united front of the working class as opposed to the popular front of the common term. The popular front is a front of different classes, therefore it has to be acceptable to the capitalists, uh, the program of it, whereas the united front is open to the development of the working class in different political tendencies having a common goal, like fighting fascism or whatever, but not being able to argue out their differences to move forward where the working class or sections of the working class are active, are political subjects, if you will. And I think that's a great contribution. Um, so I want to ask, uh, kind of, when did ideology end, or when did this age of incoherence begin? Um, and I think this kind of touches on the uh, kind of classical theme uh, from the left of materialism versus idealism. Um, in history, so a lot of times the left is saddled with being materialist against uh, the idealist, particularly the Marxist left. Um, though, of course, uh, Rosa Luxemburg. Um, in the early 20th century, critiqued her fellow socialist, Bernstein, for liquidating theory. Um, the Communist Party of the USSR was kind of notoriously anti-intellectual. Um, critiques of ideology started already to gain traction in you know, the 60s and 70s. Um, so I guess I'm asking, how is it that we got from you know, what, what might be considered uh, the era of high ideologies, of you know, Marxism, socialism, etc. Uh, in the 19th century to the incoherence, the present incoherence that the panelists described, marked by 1989. Um, and then maybe Jan's question again, which is, is it desirable to have a narrative of modern history? Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. My question is about uh, Marx, um, which is something that hasn't really come up on the panel yet so far and kind of follows on from Jacob's question about Trotskyism. Um, we've heard about uh, the We've heard a lot about socialism, which seems to be very much a symptom of our moment, even talking about socialism. Um, and we've had this kind of best of times, worst of times perspective from the panel. The ISO is dead, but the DSA has grown. Um, but at least ostensibly, the ISO was a Marxist, self-conceived organization. Um, and the DSA is not necessarily. Um, and the ISO is kind of weird in that it's a Marxist organization started after 1989, which is very rare, mm -hmm. although it does come from this Cliffite SWP tradition. Uh, but it seems that after 1989, there was this kind of defeat of Marxism, and that it became, 1989 happened to two groups of people. It happened to baby boomers from 68 who became, decided to reconsider Marxism, and then in 1989 were like, actually, no, they stopped being Marxist. And it happened to Gen Xers who decided we're not going to become Marxists. Um, they went for kind of different types of social justice values or postmodernism or various other kinds of things. So my question is, why wasn't Marxism reinvestigated after <coughs> 1989? And why isn't it being reinvestigated now? This is our last round of questions, so I'd like to give a chance of all of our panelists to provide some closing remarks and answers to the questions. And what about we start from the beginning over? Um, <coughs> when did ideology end? Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I was just thinking 
know, the best example of it, I would say, is the French debate, at least as I've been following it, where you have a Labour party which someone previously defended is still at least nominally ideological, which is completely incapable of presenting any sort of position on it, on EU, on what would happen if, if, if Britain left the EU. It's yeah. all tactical right. discussions. And never once have I heard Jeremy Corbyn, for all of his leftist credentials, utter an idea, any kind of idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know when that began. I mean, the, the politics that I grew up with was low in ideas, but in comparison to today, it had ideas. There were people um, who, who stood for things. Mm -hmm. No doubt it was you know, stronger in, in an earlier age, I, but when there was this actual quality to change, I don't know. I find your question about Marx very, very interesting, because I, I live in a world where people are constantly talking about Marx. Um, <laughs> there are people continually um, trying to rewrite Marx, and, you know, unsuccessfully in various ways. No one's mentioned Piketty, um, about whom I know only, excuse me, I hate you. But you have people like um, um, Hart and Negri, you know. Well, now, is that effective? Is it good? Alain Badiou, I don't know, in philosophy. But then in cultural critique, and this links up with Trotsky, I think Trotsky represents, for me, an approach to um, what we call Marxist theory. Now, maybe Marxist theory is the future of ideology. Maybe Marxist theory is what buried ideology. I don't know, but there's a lot of discussion of Marx and of Trotsky in academic, at least, disciplines like <coughs> history and um, theory, aesthetic theory, cultural theory. Um, so so I, I, I think Marxist analysis um, has shown itself to be extremely flexible and responsive to historical change. And, um, you know, via Trotsky, via Gramsci, via whomever, via Frederick Jameson, you know, the, these are people who um, continue to think originally in that vein, and, and I, I would think, going back to a previous question, that would be a grounds for optimism for those who want to continue to think in that vein. But it definitely um, needs to, to generate some kind of new energy and, and not rely on, on the old. Well, I, you, you do ask a, a good question. I wouldn't blame it uh, on the evisceration of the content of the Labour Party in England on uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, if one wants to look for a source of that, one would go to Tony Blair and New Labour, who took the guts out of the Labour Party, and it's never been uh, returned, unfortunately. Um, uh, I think that... Uh, it's not, not so much a question of uh, Gen X, you know, picking, uh, op, not opting for Marxism or any kind of ideology or anything like that, or the baby boom generation giving up Marx. Now that's uh, far too simplistic. Yeah, the, 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 the real reason is why there hasn't been an entire generation of Marxists after that period is because there were hardly any Marxists around to draw people around them. You know, the left, as I say, was in the process of decline. And uh, if there are, aren't people out there, a, a, a sufficient number of people who are attracting uh, other people <coughs> to Marxism, that you're not going to have a, a, you know, an entire generation imbued with them. Uh, that's basically what happened. It, it was... Uh, as, as the left began to recede, it be, became more and more and more difficult to uh, attract more and more people to Marxism. Well, uh, there's a lot here. Um, about Marxism itself, I, I somewhat disagree with the previous positions. My sense is that Marxism had grossed greatly in vitality and relevance well before 1989. Um, let's 
look at one field in which Marxist thought had once had vitality and meaning, the historiography of the French Revolution. As the 200-year celebration, centennial of the French Revolution arrives on the scene, uh, there are few, if any, defenders anymore of the old, decrepit, and frankly, widely discredited Marxist orthodoxy in respect to that epical struggle. When it comes to, okay, so within the West, basically over the 1970s, you see various attempts to resuscitate Marxism by creating ever more elaborate forms of structural Marxism that seek to integrate base and superstructure, culture, and economic change. And the end result of this is that at the end, very few people care anymore. My experience within the academy is that few people take Marxism as seriously as they once did, and by and large, they've moved on to other paradigms as having greater heuristic value. Okay, on the other side of the East-West divide within the Soviet <coughs> Union, one thing that would be useful to bear in mind when we talk about 1989, this wasn't simply a collapse and it wasn't simply a grassroots uprising. It reflected a chronic and protracted crisis within elite culture, within the Soviet state and within the Eastern Bloc, in which few people in the end actually believed any of this stuff, right? Um, the, the, the Marxism had proven itself, at least as it was understood in practice, to be an inadequate tool of analysis or perception. Andropov, Gorbachev's predecessor, right, in 1992, admits in public about the economy, we know next to nothing. That's a remarkable <laughs> concession to be made by a leader of a communist party whose forte had always been the forces of production, right? Uh, so, I mean, there is an intellectual collapse and a waning of energy and vitality that, what, that, that helps cause 1989 is not the consequence of 1989. Certainly that, from my point of view, it's that collapse <coughs> that made possible the freeing of what was still useful in the Marxist tradition from all the encumbrances of this frankly corrupted tradition and might enable us to go back to the drawing boards and know. So I'll just leave it at that. Um. <clears throat> well, I think the, the two dates that are, I think, important are 1989 and 2008 or 2009, because uh, there you have the global financial crisis, and I remember in, during that period, everybody was, uh, in the media, you know, we're all talking about the rediscovery of Marx. Was Marx right? Um, you know, about the crisis of capitalism and uh, accumulate wealth accumulation and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, Marxism is, is very relevant for us today, and, uh, but not dogmatic Marxism, not, not Marxism of another era, but Marxism which is enriched by today's uh, what's new today being, you know, any, any kind of creative science like that has to embrace what's new. And if it just uh, is dealing with questions which took place years ago but is not trying to inquire about today's reality and what's changing and what's new, it's a dead science and it's a dogmatic science. And so to be alive, it has to continue to, you know, be creative and continue to develop and embrace what's new. Um, and that kind of, I guess that kind of gets me to this, I'll wade into this issue around uh, ISO because I think that there were some other factors there too which contributed to the collapse of that organization. Uh, one is the, <clears throat> you know, the Me Too movement and what happened internally in that organization, uh, cover up of a rape. Um, you know, this is, uh, that of course was never acceptable uh, in any organization, in particular a left organization, but now in the, in the era of Me Too, uh, that's, that's the death. Uh, you know, you can't, you just can't do that. And uh, we're all, we've all changed. We've all changed as a result of, uh, you know, that movement, how we look at these things and how we address them and, and so on. Uh, the other thing is that, um, you know, the rise of DSA uh, and um, especially the uh, involvement of electoral politics and building very broad electoral alliances, um, 
And, uh, you know, at least as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, if you want to be a political factor in today's world, you have to work within the two-party system while you're building political independence. That's a very important caveat. But, um, and I think Bernie Sanders found that out. He couldn't have got 13 million votes if, if he had not run in the Democratic primary. Uh, and, and so uh, organizations that don't work, don't have an inside-outside strategy, don't make alliances, you know, with uh, all kinds of political forces that are working within the Democratic Party, you're going to be isolated. You're not going to be a factor politically in today's world. And so I think that that also uh, was a, a big uh, element of that, um, you know, their, their collapse. Um, and I say all that because, you know, the, you know, things change, society changes, the struggle changes, and you have to adapt to it. You have to be on top of it. You have to be part of it um, if you want to have an impact on, on it. I'll just leave it there. <clears throat> I agree with most of what you just said, even though I strongly disagree with a lot of everything else. <laughs> be, be, I think it's really important yeah. to remember that socialism and Marx comes out of capitalism, just as after 2008, the sales of the Communist Manifesto and capital skyrocketed, at least in the Western world and in China and other places where it was available, skyrocketed. As far as m Marxism being old or dead or irrelevant or stuffed or whatever we want to look at it, I think quite the contrary. I think the reason that Marxism, in a large part of the reason why Marxism has such a bad name is because it's identified with the failure of the Soviet Union and the Soviet model and the Eastern European model and Chinese because they all claim Marxism. You know, the Chinese have got some really brilliant new animated features about Karl Marx as a young man. Humanize him, all this kind of stuff. However, the whole point is to change it, right? Isn't that what, that's what Marx said? The whole point is to change it, not just debate it and understand it, but to change it. And in fact, it's a state religion in these countries. That makes it stale, ossified, a museum piece. They're taught rote, the same way American kids used to be taught, I don't know if they still are, but in your, if you, you still have history classes or American history in grammar school, you learned all these important names and all these important events. It was all stuffed and dried. You almost never got anything about living struggles. And in the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, and in China, that's what Marxism is because it covers up for the essentially exploitative nation, nature of these societies. It has to be. When you see it grow, it's in China, for example, uh, how many people here are familiar with the fact that the Chinese Communist Party has imprisoned a number of Chinese Communist students in the elite universities for the crime of aligning themselves with industrial workers in struggle who wanted to create their own union because the goddamn unions run by the party and the state are company unions. So there's living Marxism and there's museum Marxism. Museum Marxism is the Marxism that was taught and that's what most, most of the world said. So most people in the world who didn't spend their life studying this said, you know what, that shit don't work. It ain't, work. It ain't for me. No, <coughs> you have to be able to see beyond that. Otherwise, let's just go out and get drunk. <laughs> <laughs>